Welcome back to my shop. It's been a while since I've given you an update and it's not that I've been sitting around. I've been busy working on a passenger car, parlor car restoration at Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad. Also, I've been super busy keeping up with quarters because this is the time of year where they do all the maintenance on their locomotives and train sets. So there's a few spare days that pop up here and there where I can keep working on this guy. Last time we left off, my friend Mike Soldano came over and helped me find the centers for all of the mounting studs for both the gearbox side and the bell housing side of this adapter plate. Then we set up in his machine shop because he has much heavier duty equipment and we started machining the adapter plate. Here we're roughing out the center hole. When we do our final pass, we'll use a boring bar and get the precise dimensions to allow just a few thousandths of clearance between this hole and the little raised casting on the bell housing. Next we put the piece on Mike's milling machine and it has digital readout so we found the center of this piece right in the center of the hole by using a little wobbler finder where you just touch the edge and once you touch it it'll start to wobble. You make a note of that position and then you go to the other end and do the same thing. Then you add the two coordinates up and divide by two and that's your center location. Then you zero out that axis and do the same for the other axis and that gives you dead center on the part so you can reference that point all through the machining process. After that we just followed the drawing showing the XY coordinate of each hole location and drilled the pilot hole and then later came along and tapped it. In order to create a clean flat surface for the bell housing to sit against we needed to recess the nuts that go on the studs so we used an end mill to create these recesses. And here's the test fit against the bell housing. Everything looks good so far. Now let's take a look at the function of the pre-selector gearbox mechanism. Here we are, we're looking at the guts of the pre-selector gearbox. When I received this box, it was supposedly fully rebuilt and adjusted, but I found out that some of these springs were a little bit sticky, so they had to be exercised. Now I've got all the gears working, but let's go through the basic principle of how this works. These each are struts operate a linkage that cinches around these brake bands. Here's the operation of the bus bar again. You can see that moving up and down inside the box. Select a gear, it grabs the gear. Select another gear, grabs that one, cinches up on the linkage, grabs the band. I'm gonna push in on this linkage to select third, come down and you hear it engage. Now the bus bar is gonna lift up and now it's cinched up on that band. That band is cinched up around the drum and now we've selected third. If I move to another gear, let's say for example, second, you push down, you heard third disengage, it popped back out and now the linkage for second is pressing against. When you let up, it catches second. And now I'll take you down below you can see second is now engaged on the knife edge bus bar. Here's the back side of the side cover on the gearbox. When you rotate the little lever to select a gear, it causes the cam to rotate. And when a flat spot of the cam gets in front of one of these C-shaped levers, it allows the lever to spring out and push against the actuating strut for the brake band mechanism of that gear. You can see how this all goes together. Here's the adapter plate that has a set of studs. In fact, you can see one here and the rest are buried inside the metal, laid out in a clock pattern. And those studs go into the transmission casing on this end plate. And so that allows us to bolt this adapter to this. And then coming the other way, there's studs that come out of that aluminum adapter and go this direction. And so we can attach the bell housing to this. And the reason we need an adapter is because there are bolt heads and other things sticking out of this transmission that don't allow this to sit directly on this surface. There's also a big boss down here below. I think it's part of the bearing seal and maybe a drain back area. So we needed this plate to give us that distance. And this plate is mostly hollow on the inside. There's kind of a rim of thick material around the edge 
where these studs are, but then we hollowed out the inside. That allows room for all of those other things that stick out of this plate. You can see it fits very well. Okay, and here's what the setup looks like with the remote selector. So this gives you the gears. We'll look at it from the top. We have reverse, which is, has a lockout to prevent you from grabbing that at speed. Neutral, first, second, third, fourth. What this does, there's a little bevel gear in here that turns a shaft, and we're just moving this sector arm up and down. And that's translating to a motion in this. What this does is it drives another bevel gear that rolls a cam over, and that cam has flat spots cut out. And whenever a flat spot gets in front of the right little spring, that spring sticks out, pushes against the actuating strut, and that strut is what grabs the brake band of the gear you selected. We had to get this motion translated to this motion with unequal lever arms, and I needed to figure out the geometry of that. So I used some algebra, so I knew what the length of the arm on the other one was, and I knew how far it moved top to bottom, the total, total distance between top and bottom position, like that. So I set up a proportion. I had lever arm length over travel length. And then on this new gearbox, I have the travel length can be measured. I can take all this off. In fact, I'll do it for you. And I can measure there to there as the total travel length. And then on the top of that fraction is X, which is the length that this lever arm needs to be to get to there given the rest of the equation. And so I solved for X and it gave me a length of this lever arm, which was, I forget what the number was, but I made it that length with this adjustable thing. I also made an adjustable offset because I needed to clear this screw. And so this gives me additional adjustability if I ever need to dial this in, if for some reason one gear isn't quite catching, I can adjust the range a little bit to try to catch it better. And so you can see it's at the extreme end of that range. When I go up here, it's at the extreme end of that range. I can feel it hitting the stop right there. So in order to double check that this motion was properly selecting each gear, I took this cover off and I checked the position of those little C-shaped spring steel things for each position of this lever. And so I selected, for example, reverse, which is right there. And with reverse selected, I made a punch as a reference here and then another one here. And you can see there's neutral, there's first, second, third, fourth, and they line up precisely, which means the graduations of motion here translate to the right motion here so that we're not splitting a gear. If you split a gear on this gearbox, like for example, if both the struts for second and third are sticking out, it will grab them, but neither will engage because there's a safety lockout. Otherwise, you can imagine if you grab both second and third, one of those brake bands is gonna get really upset, probably get glazed over. And I've tested every single one of these gears in between. I've got my, my manual lever. This helps me overcome the main spring in here that, that engages these bands. And so I can do a gear and then actuate this, and then I can spin this shaft and watch that spin accordingly. And I can do that first all the way through reverse. There's neutral. First will come up a little more, etc. So that way I can test it and I can go from one gear to the next and up and down and skip all around. And I was able to hit them all reliably with this linkage. These are stainless steel quick release fittings. There's just a spring loaded coupler here. You can see, and we can take it off. So if I ever have to do any servicing on this gearbox, I can do that. It makes it much easier. I made the rod. This is just stainless steel threaded for quarter inch, 28 thread per inch for these fittings, and then bent it according to this profile. And then once I got it in place, I adjust the length so that the maximum and minimum of this lever arm also caused this to reach its maximum and minimum. So we're all set. The next thing I have to do is go back in and seal this cover plate to here 
and this cover plate to here because I took those apart in order to inspect everything before I built everything up. The next step for this guy will be to put this adapter plate on the engine flywheel setup. Because each gear is its own clutch, there's no clutch on the flywheel. We just have an adapter plate here and a rubber donut. This donut was to relieve shock on the drivetrain on the original cars because some of the axles could snap with the horsepower they produced. So we will add this splined adapter, which is a larger diameter because it's a bigger gearbox, to where this one is at. And then that gearbox will slip right in there. The order of operations in this car is a little different. Because that firewall sort of has a close clearance against the gearbox and the bell housing, you can't slip it in backward because the gearbox won't fit horizontally through that opening. It has to come up through the bottom. You kind of slide it up into position and then support it. And then you bring the engine up to it and move it into place. So that's what we'll do next time. And I'm looking forward to seeing that because that means the car is at the halfway point and it's starting to go back together. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to keep up with my progress.